Greetings, Zero and Repeater Books readers. There is a deep shortcoming today that plagues left-wing groups in Britain and beyond, and that is a failure to orient our action around the needs and interests of the working class. Some presume to know what is in the interest of the working class, while others proclaim that the working class no longer exists. What these groups lack in either case is a connection with the everyday struggles of ordinary working class people. Seeking to remedy this error, the British group Notes from Below was founded in 2018, following Ed Emery's 1995 proposal titled No Politics Without Inquiry, an injunction reminiscent of Mao Zedong's No Inquiry, No Right to Speak. In 2021, during the worst days of the coronavirus pandemic, Notes from Below began a new project embodying Ed Emery's proposal to undertake a large-scale analysis of class in Britain today, orienting itself from the perspective of the workers rather than the government or the bosses. Today, we're joined by three members of the Notes from Below Collective, Jamie, Chaz, and Matthew, to talk about the book in which this project culminated, titled Class Composition in Britain. On a personal note, I'm very excited to have this opportunity to speak with the group. I've been following their work since they came into existence during my undergraduate days, and I'm only too pleased to have this opportunity to welcome them onto the show. So. Jamie, Chaz, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. Glad to have yes. <laughs> well, just to start off our conversation, I think it would be good if you could introduce yourselves uh, and if you could give our listeners an overview of Notes from Below and its history, how it came into existence and its relation to other already existing groups on the British left. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, my name is Jamie. I'm an editor of Notes from Below, and I uh, I work as a researcher. Um, and for us, Notes from Below was really about trying to address address that question that you were talking about at the beginning of you know why is there a disconnect between the left uh, and an understanding of what's happening at work or the workers' movement more broadly. Um, and so for us, the project was about you know, not sitting in rooms with other people on the left who we all know what our disagreements and agreements are, but instead going out and trying to get involved in in workers' inquiries of different kinds, of worker writing, and of trying to recover a yeah, a tradition if you can call it that, of of people on, you know, revolutionary movements that have tried to to think about how class is changing and what it means for people to to intervene in it. So that's like the very yeah, like whistle-stop tour of why notes from below. But I'm sure Matthew and Chaz have, have things they want to say as well. Well, from my perspective, so um, I actually got involved in notes from below because of the class composition project and because of the idea of trying to build from the perspective of workers within different sectors a picture of what was happening at that time. Um, that was something that, you know, I've been a political activist on the left since 2009, 2010. And for me, that was something obviously um, crucial to really try to understand what's going on and also to be able to enable me to even at a basic level have the confidence to organise at work as well. Um, so, yeah, that's how I got involved in Notion Below. Yeah, I'm similar to Chaz that... Um... I got involved in Notion Below during the Class Composition Project. Um, although sort of, I'm, I'm also similar to you, Kenny, in the sense that I was an undergrad when, when Notion Below was founded. I remember it um, sort of around a couple of the people who were involved at the time. Um, and sort of just like the month or two after, after Notes launched, there was the, the first round of UCU strikes, which are somehow still going on. Um, <laughs> And Notes from Below produced a bulletin for that, for that strike called the University Worker um, that, you know, was handed out by loads of people on picket lines, was read by loads of people, um, organised like a big demo when the union tried to set out um, the strike uh, and intervened quite critically in, in, that, in that dispute. And I think for me, that was sort of the start of, of something that showed that there is a way to like critically intervene in struggles 
um, that people on the ground are probably the most predisposed to that act uh, and think about how uh, we should move forward as a movement. Um, and yeah, getting involved in the class competition project, you know, I was working education at the time um, and I was involved in, you know, mostly that sector. And it, you know, it really gives you the confidence to, to speak with authority um, and feel like what you're, you know, producing and saying actually matters uh, just by means of, you know, where you sit uh, within society and, and the social relations that you embody uh, as a worker. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of a whistle-stop tour of my experience with Notes from Below. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, let's talk a little bit about the methodology that you use in this book. Uh, to study class composition in contemporary Britain, you use a particular methodology called workers' inquiry. Uh, it's a methodology with a very interesting history. Uh, and I had another of your comrades, Clark, Mistal Clark McAllister, on the show previously uh, to discuss his book on it. Um, and workers' inquiry usually comes with this supplementary theory of class composition, which gives your book its title. Um, but while class composition has usually been theorized as just having these two big components, technical composition and political composition, uh, what's unique about the way that Notes from Below approaches it is that you've added this third component, social composition. Uh, so could you tell us maybe a little bit about you know, what workers' inquiry and class composition are and what led you to make this alteration to the classical theory of class composition? I, mean, I, I can start with that. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's... Um, on what workers' inquiry is, is, I guess it's an important point to make, um, that workers' inquiry isn't, by its very nature, um, a revolutionary tool. It's not something that always, um, you know, works just on the side of workers, uh, not on the side of bosses. Um, I think there's, there's a, you know, some good examples people have made uh, around the factory inspectors in Capital by Marx. You know, they were doing a workers' inquiry of sorts by c talking to workers, um, getting workers' reports, you know, uh, trying to collate information. Um, but that information, you know, in a way, was going towards helping the bosses to sort of rationalise workplaces and, and quell labour disputes. Um, similarly, you have, like, Undercover Boss Now, um, which Jamie has written about, uh, where, you know, you have bosses going and working in the places undercover where they, in the companies they run, um, in an attempt to, you know, again, rationalise work uh, and kind of, you know, root out those workers that are a bit mischievous or, or uh, don't maybe work as hard. Um, but for us, I guess, Works Inquiry, you know, it's about uh, finding sort of critical nodes to intervene in. Um, it's about, you know, trying to work out where the class is now, um, where it could go, uh, and how we can do that. Um, and I just think it's really, you know, important to, to, to be on the ground and talk to workers to do that. Because, you know, especially right now, it's so easy for, for the left, so to speak, to have a disconnect from, um, uh, from, from realities. I mean, we don't even know, really know sort of what sectors uh, still exist in, in, the, in the ways they used to. Um, you know, to what level has the industrialization actually happened? Um, which sectors are emerging, which are growing? Um, within these sectors, what are the, you know, potential antagonisms that can be provoked and escalated and generalized? Um, these are all questions that are like vital uh, to answer if you want to, you know, have any sort of relevance and, and do any meaningful sort of political intervention. Um, and Works Inquiry is the sort of uh, tool that can help lead us there, but it's by no means, you know, the end. Um, you've got to combine that with other projects. Uh, you've got to, pro you know, combine that with uh, implementing the results of Works Inquiry uh, in political interventions, uh, in using workers' inquiry as a tool for agitation um, and collaborating with workers um, to help them, you know, self-organize. Um, and also it means for yourself as a worker to sort of understand where you lie in this, in this grand system, uh, where your power is, where your leverage is, because, you know, even if you're, uh, you know, studied Marx for years or whatever, uh, you can work in a place and have, like, no clue um, what effects you could have in disrupting that place because um, the very nature of capitalism aims to hide that from you. Um, working that out is, you know, of seminal importance for any sort of struggle 
in your workplace. Unless um, you happen to work in a, like uh, an early industrialized cotton mill. Well, yeah, <laughs> exactly, using the same exactly. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I'll let, I'll let the others talk a bit more about the nitty gritty of sort of social composition and all that. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. I, I mean, I think I think it's a really good sum up of uh, 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 of the kind of problems, but also that this isn't like a sort of you do inquiry and then everything's sorted. You know, it's not a kind of one quick trick to communism, right? Um, which I'm always a bit suspicious of, of things where someone's like, if only we all did this, everything would would be sorted. But on the other hand, if everyone who thinks they're involved in the left like went and started organizing with people um, and organizing their own workplaces and trying to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the class at different points, we would be a lot further along where we want to get to than, than where we are right now. Um, but it's not a kind of quick thing to do, right? Like you can't say we'll do inquiry for one day and then like, boom, you've got the answers and, and everything's sort of ready to go. I guess for us, one of the things when we started doing inquiries with Notes From Below and thinking about particularly the Italian traditions was trying to think about like, what do you do with what you find out with people in an inquiry. So if you find out something about how the details of the work are changing and how when people go through that kind of work, they find you know, new tactics or strategies to collectively resist or to build organization or, or, or like whatever it might be, that there was a bit missing from the traditional kind of analysis that you know, it's always been the case that workers do things outside of work. Um, you know, that workers reproduce themselves out, outside of work and that the way that people do that affects the forms of struggle they're able to do or undermines forms of struggles that they're able to be a part of. And so we thought about this idea of social composition, of how the class is composed outside of the workplace. And so this is about, you know, thinking of things like what's people's relationship to housing, um, you know, if housing is more or less precarious or is more dispersed or more concentrated, like this has an effect on, on how people struggle. And one of the examples that I think about for making sense of this is like, if you look at previous waves of industrial struggle, people often lived in communities near workplaces. You know, there were strong social ties that developed around those. Um, you know, the kinds of infrastructure that people had, you know, made an effect on, on the forms of struggles that they were able to take. And then also thinking more widely, you know, particularly in a city like London, the relationship to the state, to migration, to whether or not you're, you have documents, uh, to issues of oppression, that all of these things are important for making sense of how class composition is changing because it can help us to understand how people, how people can recompose. And so a lot of this came from, from a bunch of inquiries that some of us did with uh, with platform workers, so particularly delivery riders, and trying to understand those other relationships that are broader than the labor process. Um, because, you know, the labor process is obviously the critical part of understanding work, but it's those other bits too, and trying to understand those. And I think, you know, kind of coming off from those sort of inquiries and trying to make sense of things, it, for us, and yeah, I, I mean, I'm not going to speak for for Matthew and Chaz. Maybe they'll they'll disagree uh, with what I'm saying here. But it's also a kind of theorization that fits with the experience that you have with lots of groups of workers, right? To find out things about how people are composed socially, like it makes sense if you want to understand these things. Um, and I think has been one of the important contributions of of notes from below to that kind of broader history that you were talking about earlier, Kenny. Sorry, I think you're muted, Chaz. My bad. Uh, rookie error. Um, one That's thing right. I think one thing that I think came through um, in um, the work that we were doing for the book and the preparation for that as well was that we started to really see um, how or, or we started to, and I don't, you know, we don't really go all the way down that road, but we started to see how different industries were focused in particular areas across the country as well. And that started to come through in the discussions that we had with some of the interviewees as well, um, where they would talk about how they maybe worked in a particular industry and it was in a specific location that they would have a regular commute to every day. 
and then when they have to move uh, to a different job, it might be in a similar kind of geography. Um, particularly, I remember one clear example being one of the interviewees that we had um, in who was a tech worker whose um, workplace was literally within uh, over the space of 20 years was within 10 square miles around the M4 corridor. So there you could start to see how the experience of all of those people within that geographic location and within that locality, you can start to see that um, overlap with their workplace. And that sort of, you can then, you know, make some hypotheses as well that maybe other workers within that industry who live within that area are going to be facing similar kind of issues, like what Jamie was talking about. Especially, you know, at the moment, the big question is around cost of living and, and also housing because the property market's on the rocks. So, all of that features as part of our understanding of work. And perhaps is that more so than what it was historically, right? Jamie was talking about that historical trend of how workplaces and communities often had a lot of overlap. Um, one of the things that came through in some of the work of the, the class composition book was um, how people didn't have that same overlap. You know, geographies were much more dispersed. Uh, people had different commutes to get to work, much longer commutes perhaps than they would have had some time ago. Um, and there's there's so many layers you can go into with that as well, right? Like, well, what is the history of those geographies? What politically has happened to them over time? You know, a massive part of British history is the deindustrialization and what, with the ascent of neoliberalism. Um, what happened in the North and what are the industries that have taken its place of the mine or the big factories or the mills, you know, if you want to go back even further historically. Um, so it, I think it starts to really give you a shape of not just what's happened from an industrial perspective, but actually what has been the experience for the working class in that area over the, over that time period. Well, just so we can nail this down for the listeners uh, uh, in a nutshell, <laughs> what is class composition and how does workers inquiry enable one to study it that's maybe more of a theoretically loaded question but i think that's a good thing to have nailed down at the start of our conversation i i guess you know a brief overview of class composition um and i guess there's a point to be made that you know this is always contested um the exact details of of what makes it up and how works and cry fits in and all that but in a simple way, um, and the way that we, we've we've sort of outlined it, notes from below is you have the technical com composition, uh, which relates to how work is organised in a workplace, um, uh, sort of like the organic composition of capital, like um, you know what are you using, uh, how is when do you work, how is time like tasks divided up, um, where do products come in from that you then use uh, and add value to. Um, and that sort of thing. And then sort of with that, you also have the social composition aspect, which um, Chaz and Jamie have talked about, um, which relates to, you know, the reproduction of the workers uh, uh, and sort of other issues uh, outside the workplace, um, which then feed into, you know, struggle um, both in and outside the workplace. So, you know, yeah, like we said, housing, where they live, um, you know, relationships to the state and borders, um, their gender, you know, their race, all this sort of stuff um, fits in. Uh, the division of labor, you know, in terms of those aspects too, uh, is important. And then these two things, so the social and technical composition, help dictate the political composition of workers. So that is how they organize themselves uh, against capital, against work, uh, against this stuff. But the important point to make is this is not a, you know, deterministic relationship it's not like we're saying if something is composed technically this way and socially composed this way then that will produce x political composition right the point is this stuff can always change is always different uh there's no one formula that that you know can standardize this and actually that's the exciting part um because then within that leap from the social and technical composition to the political composition there's an opportunity to intervene. There's an opportunity to change stuff. Uh, and that starts with inquiry. Uh, that starts with workers 
who are you know the ones making that leap and the ones engaged in that work uh can you know inquire they can investigate they can uh they can compose themselves through that inquiry uh to then alter their political composition and ultimately change um you know how their work is composed um change how class struggle is formed uh and hopefully eventually overcome capitalism entirely um but this is a constant you know this is a cycle that constantly feeds back into itself when you change the political composition that will that will change the technical and social composition which again you know you have to restart the whole process um and you're sort of stuck in it until you find a way to sort of rupture uh, and escape capitalism entirely um but in a shell hopefully that that makes sense of what class composition is well if uh if Jamie and Chaz don't want to add anything to that, here's maybe just a, a brief follow-up question before we move on. Uh, why talk about class composition instead of the much more uh, standard and prevalent historical term of class consciousness? Why class composition rather than class consciousness? Yeah, I think this is a good question. And I mean, I have a view on this, um, which may be... We can we can have a bit more more of a discussion on. I, I guess for me, one of the problems with the idea of class consciousness is this idea that there is a kind of an objective consciousness, um, a kind of natural way that workers could or should behave if they were only had the veil pulled away to discover the kind of the truth underneath it. And I think this can create a bit of a problem for for Marxists in that you can end up with this sense that there is like a truth out there already that just needs to be brought to workers. So I, for example, and yeah, this may be a, a point of debate, but, you know, I find the idea of false consciousness to be a kind of strange way for Marxists to think of uh, of what's happening uh with workers and why you know workers aren't revolutionary as they've you know they've been duped or whatever it is and i think the idea of class composition is trying to understand like how consciousness of different kinds appear or like how different subjectivities appear and that the kind of work people do the kind of communities they live in and the kind of ways that they fight is both each of those are both a product and a producer of struggle um, and it's through those experiences that people develop the kinds of subjectivities that can do what Matthew was saying, to be able to to break out of those cycles or to do other things. Whereas, if you think about consciousness, it, it, it's a, you know it's difficult to think of why there might be different rival forms of consciousness or which one, you know, is the correct one. Whereas the reality is, we end up meeting lots of workers in different situations with different kinds of struggles uh, who can work together in different ways. And so I, th I think it's a much more powerful way of understanding uh, a kind of worker-focused politics that isn't about us bringing a truth to people, but is about collectively all of us figuring out like what we do and why we try and do it and where it's going, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think that's also a really interesting point that class composition as a theory tries to deal with uh, class consciousnesses in the plural and the production of, say, resistant subjectivities out of material circumstances without this, you know, existing mechanically or without it uh, always being deferred to some universal consciousness that all workers are in some way presumed to share. Um, with, with that aside, then, how about we get on to the meat of the book itself? Um, in the book, you focus on four industries in particular, uh, healthcare, education, charity and retail. Uh, what's interesting about the selection is that it doesn't include any of the usual commodity producing industries with which Marxists have usually been concerned. Uh, I imagine that this choice partly reflects the change in class composition in Britain, with production mostly being handed off to countries in the global periphery. Uh, but I'd like to ask you about this. Why these industries rather than others? And maybe also, what limitations are there to focusing on these industries? Or are there other industries which a future workers' inquiry might benefit from focusing on? Sorry, that's quite a barrage of questions. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess to start answering your question on why these industries, I think, you know, the most simple answer, maybe this is not uh, 
what we'd necessarily want to admit, but you know, these are the industries <laughs> where, where we knew people and people got involved in the projects were based. Um, you know, it wasn't uh, pre-selected necessarily. Um, and I think it's maybe not unsurprising that, you know, the places where we know people work uh, and the people who are maybe interested in this sort of project work were healthcare, education, um, retail, uh, you know, charity sector, these sort of things. Um, but I also think there's there's something else, you know, underlying that in the sense that health and education um, are the, you know, two biggest sectors in, in the country. Um, there's millions and millions of workers involved in these sectors. Um, there is a hospital, well, maybe not in every town anymore, but there's, a hosp- there's hospitals all over the place. There's a school in like every village, every town, every city. Um, you know, these major huge huge portions of the workforce in this country um they have huge ramifications for for society um you know they're, they're central to the reproduction of 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 everyone <laughs> uh, particularly in an aging country like britain um and yeah and also they're they're you know at least in the case of education incredibly unionized education's got 50 percent union density across the sector um, and it's natural that, you know, the sort of people who'd be attracted to this project who are, you know, mostly uh, shop stewards and like rank and file trade unionists and people who are interested in, you know, this sort of idea of, of a return to work and, and restudying work um, would be attracted to this sort of project. Um, yeah, and I forgot what the other questions were, but <laughs> I'll let others. Uh, another one was in a future workers inquiry, are there any other industries that you'd like to focus on? I mean, we're, we're, we've been discussing this recently. Um, and I think we're, we're really interested. Um, uh, we've, we've, you know, got contacts and links with these places now to, to start investigating stuff like agricultural labor, um, to start investigating stuff like docks and, uh, logistics work, uh, and road haulage. Um, these all, you know, sort of sectors where, uh, struggle is happening uh and seems incredibly important and will be increasingly important uh particularly as the climate crisis uh continues um so yeah that's sort of the dream and hopefully soon the reality of uh, where our inquiries will go yeah i think a couple of things to add on to this i mean i think at the beginning when you introduced the book you said it began during the pandemic um i in some ways i sort of wish it did begin during the pandemic rather than (laughs) beginning just before we knew anything about the pandemic um and let's say you know inquiries when you're under a lockdown are a harder thing to do um although of course lots of places don't have factory gates that you can go and stand outside anymore this isn't to say you can't go and do physical stuff when you want to do inquiries you know i i do think what are the most important? What, yeah, we can overcomplicate inquiry sometimes by making it sound like it is an academic tool or a kind of something that you need to be trained in doing. Is there's always a moment of inquiry when you go and talk to people about their work? The question is how you make explicit what you're doing, how you find ways to develop it, and so on. So, one of the limitations of the project is you know, we had plans to have lots of physical meetings to go out and meet new people to go to workplaces and then like a week and a half later a global pandemic started which obviously stimmied some of those things um and i think in part the book should be seen as a kind of you know even in a moment like a pandemic collectively we can be figuring out what's happening in lots of places um and i also think part of this was you know how do we how do we think about what sectors are important and how do we think about where there are connections now? And I think you're right to say that kind of traditional Marxists have a particular interest in sectors that are valorized by Marxists in one way or another as being like proper workers or proper industries or, or whatever it is. But the reality is, you know, all of those things that are being made, whether they're being made in Britain or or across the world through various forms of global labor arbitrage or logistics networks still need to be sold, right? Um, And so retail is a core part of the general processes of capital accumulation and production, right? Um, Making things is not enough for capitalism. 
Um, and we know very, very little about how retail works, the conditions in lots of kinds of retail, the forms of struggle that people enter into, because it's seen often as a kind of, you know, this is a job that people do for a while, they move on regularly, they might be students while they're doing it. It's kind of written off by lots of people as like, this isn't going to be an important sector. But if you think about how we reproduce ourselves, you know, we need access to retail. You know, I can't grow my own food, right? It would be a disaster if I tried to do that. So also trying to think about how some of these sectors are are important to the economy. Um, but then as Matthew says too, it's also about, you know, where is the existing left in lots of places? It's around things like healthcare, education, um, these kinds of public sector jobs, which have different dynamics to private sector jobs in lots of ways. Um, but having an opportunity to bring people collectively together in those sectors to talk that stuff through is one of the ironies is, you know, there are so, so, so many of the left in public sector jobs who don't spend time talking about how their work has changed, what it means to be a, a trade unionist in those sectors, what it means to be a revolutionary, that, you know, there often aren't those discussions that happen that we really wanted to push to see, like, you know, how has education changed? What's it like to be a teacher or a lecturer? You know, what are the differences between them? What connections can be made and so on? I still think there's lots of useful political stuff we can do in those sectors. It's also just in terms of when we actually got our teeth into putting, starting to gather some of that material, you know, it started with an initial survey. So in a sense, it's who responded to the survey. <laughs> it's the sectors that got, um, that got included. But then also on top of that, um, just to add a bit more detail to what Jamie was saying, the, we had massive issues with communicating because we wanted to take that collaborative approach of the publication being as much as possible a worker's voice and for as much of the experience of workers themselves who are participating in the project to be what's included, uh, what is detailed coming out of it. Um, and so, you know, trying to work in a sort of co-collaborative way in like Jamie said, in lockdown with multiple different um, things that people were struggling with as a result of that. And then the forum that we had this forum that we were using to uh, sort of garner some of that or try and host some of that collaborative work. And, you know, it was something that we were constantly trying to iterate to try and progress with how it was being used. Um, so, yeah, it was it was not easy. It was a very difficult project to start. I guess I'll just add on to what Chaz said um, in that, you know, at the start and throughout, we had people from loads of different workplaces, loads of different industries getting involved. Um, you know, we had manufacturing, transport, um, arts and culture, tech, IT, all sorts of stuff. Um, and what's in the book is just what we managed to get written down um, before a certain time and where we had the capacity to, you know, write stuff. Um, so it's by no means, you know, um, conducive of the, of the, you know, entire project as a whole. I'm sure there's lots of different sort of little strands um, that happen throughout um, that, you know, pen didn't get put to paper on, but uh, maybe had some slight effect and maybe helped us work out things uh, a little bit more than we did before. Well, we just as a, as a shorter question related to that one. While completing the, ca the class composition projects, uh, were there any findings that particularly surprised you or that were really unexpected? So that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, I think, you know, whenever you talk to people about their experiences at work, it's never a kind of closed discussion right like you always find things that are surprising and things that remind you of like the vitality of a politics that's based on people's struggles at work and the possibilities of those those building and developing rather than a kind of you know there's a range of other left-wing politics at the moment that are about like other people doing stuff right um you know kind of much more kind of you know voting for someone electing somebody to a union position you know these kinds of politics that are not feeling like they're making a lot of ground at the moment and so i mean it sounds a bit hackneyed but like you know i'm always 
I'm always interested in hearing about the like the gritty details of people's work and how like whether it was in retail, you know, in the Amazon warehouses where people watch TikTok videos about going on strike and then decided they were going to walk out. Like I'm always like not surprised because I believe that everyone can find a way to struggle and find a way to do these things at work in you know in, in different ways, but you know to keep finding those things is a kind of you know in a moment that was pretty bleak the pandemic right you're still finding people are organizing people are trying to do things so yeah is it surprising because i've just said i believe it can always happen everywhere like it shouldn't be right but also it's like it reminds you of the vibrancy of of that politics and the possibility of change i mean there's a there's some i think Maybe surprising is the wrong word, but I think there were some interesting things that maybe filled in a bit of a picture of how we saw uh, how we saw working life in Britain, right? And uh, just one of those that I think um, really stood out very early on was around the working week and how we were starting to see much more fragmentation across what kind of working patterns people had, um, much more than we thought would than we expected. Given the sectors that we were talking about, you know, um, we were surprised. Um, and that, that's something I think that we had a number of follow-on questions that, you know, you can capture something on a survey, but actually it's when you start to get into the interview phases and you can really drill down in how people's experience that we wanted to see if that would generalise. And, it, you know, we didn't see that as clearly across some of the interviewees and some of the sectors that we drilled down into. But I think it's definitely something that we are looking out at um, more widely. And one of the other things, just what you were saying, Jamie, about um, how even in the context of a pandemic, we, um, you know, you see how people um, find ways to struggle. And one of the things that really sort of set the context early on was the good laws dispute, where we saw um, like teams of workers who were basically um their their role was sort of an admin tech work role for processing uh, applications for this letting agency i don't know if i'm misremembering what good lords does or well, was a landlord that okay basically it was a landlord's letting agency and they they basically got fire and rehire offers where they were going to see a huge reduction in their pay and they were told that they would be working from home and so wouldn't need as much money um because of you know, lockdown and everyone working from home as a result of the changes that they'd had to make. So that was like, it really, you know, there was lots of little instances like that with um, disputes or stories that people were telling us of what they were seeing in their workplace that were really resonated um, with some of the wider things that we already sort of guessed that or kind of expected, but then also added a massive level of detail to some of the um, wider phenomena that we were seeing elsewhere as well. Uh, yeah, I guess a similarly, you know, surprising maybe isn't the wrong, isn't the right word because uh, it's sort of stuff that was already encompassed in our politics. But for me, I think a big thing um, that came out of, of a lot of the interviews and a lot of the survey responses uh, was the number of people who you know, really wanted to, to organize at work, wanted to be involved in trade unions of their work, uh, but said they couldn't because they didn't have the time to become a rep or their workplace already had a rep uh, and their union, you know, there's no meetings, there's no branch meetings, there's no way to get involved. Um, they've been told they couldn't get involved unless they, you know, uh, jumped through these hoops and did certain things. Um, and it was really interesting to see, you know, that on paper, the idea that, you know, in many cases, trade unions uh, are hampering struggle um, and blocking people who are really keen from getting involved in struggle. But despite that, people would, would find ways to struggle outside of, of those forms, um, particularly in education. I saw it a lot where people, um, you know, were organizing uh, outside of unions. And, you know, unless you spoke to these people, unless you, you know, did interview with them, unless you talked to them, uh, you'd have no idea this is happening um, because it's not, visible um to the wider eye there's no like social media profile for your 
informal, you know, workers group uh, for your, you know, guerrilla resistance in the workplace. Um, and I think what was also really interesting about the process was was seeing stuff that you already knew, but also you didn't know. Like, you know, in, in education, uh, I was working as a teaching assistant at the time. Uh, and one of the things we, we theorize and we write about in the education chapter is this chain of de-skilling um, down from teachers um, through to HLTAs and, and teaching assistants and, and other staff. Uh, and it was something that, you know, I sort of, you knew was happening. You, you know, you saw yourself getting all these segmented extra tasks, extra work. Uh, you saw people asking, being asked to cover stuff that they won't, you know, pay to cover. Um, you saw changes to the way teachers' work was happening, but you, you couldn't really pinpoint it and you couldn't really um, speak of it on your own. But when you got down and sat in you know, a group of 12 people where everyone's doing different jobs, where you have all different sorts of people who have worked for different periods of time in different places, and you start to piece it together like a jigsaw and you see this wider picture and it's like, whoa, that's, that's what's going on. Like I sort of, you know, saw the edge of that, but now I can see the whole thing. Um, and there's a lot of moments like that, which was, you know, I think really affirms the importance of doing this stuff. Um, and yeah, it was probably like the most interesting stuff that came out of it for me. Now, you mentioned the trade unions there. And I think that leads on pretty well to the next question that I had in mind. Uh, at the end of chapter two of the book, you give an overview of what the class composition project is meant to achieve. There, you write that, uh, quote, the ultimate aim of the class composition project is to support worker organizing by providing access to the sorts of information that bosses have at their disposal and creating a space for networks of workers to come together collectively around industries and issues. In that regard, you will either need to break down these barriers to union involvement or explore new options for organizing, end quote. Uh, the union question is a massive one, especially with the wave of industrial strikes happening right now in Britain. Uh, but I'd like to get your thoughts on it. How reliant are workers in the UK right now on their unions when it comes to resistance at work? Do you think that worker resistance needs to shed its reliance on unions to be successful? And what are the strengths and limitations of non-union worker resistance, things like wildcat strikes? I mean, I'll have a go at this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, you know, it's one of the big questions, right? Um, I think the way, the way that I see it, and, you know, I'll let Jamie and Chaz say what they think. Um, but it's, it's a difficult question because on the one hand, you know, unions are this historic force institution that that you can't just wish away you know we can critique them all we want and say you know we can point out all the bad things they do um the way they hamper stuff but ultimately you know we're not going to get a mass migration from unions happening um through our you know scathing and critiques uh, as important as they are so it's about looking for the ways in which we can engage in union struggles how we can sort of push them further um when there are moments of, you know, extra union um, organizing, which happens all the time uh, by this very nature, because, you know, there's stuff that unions simply will not do. Um, they will not touch because of the structural limitations of them as institutions. And, you know, it's those moments and in those sort of, you know, extra institutional forms um, that we have to, you know, one, locate and two, work out, intervene in how to generalize, how to do stuff with. Um, so I think, you know, one, I guess one, you know, contemporary example of this um, that we've been speaking about is in terms of the current teacher strikes, right? Where you have a mandate in England for, um, for teaching staff, uh, for teachers, um, and they're going on strike through the union. Um, and the union, you know, up to this point is supporting that strike is, you know, in fact, quite involved and quite heavily worked to get that banner out. Um, then at the same time, you have you support staff um, who were also balloted where the union necessarily didn't really care as much, didn't put in the effort, um, where there's less of a, you know, uh, a reps network of a sort of, you know, grassroots um, organizer base. 
uh, and that ballot hasn't passed. Yet you're seeing in, you know, a not insignificant number of schools, support staff refusing to cross picket lines, um, effectively wildcat striking uh, along with their teaching colleagues because they recognize that there's, you know, industrial strength in there or, you know, for whatever other reason, uh, maybe it's just too awkward to go to work. Um, so it's moments like that when you say, well, there's a situation. What can we do about it? How can we increase people's confidence? How can we increase organization uh, in these forms, which have the potential to go much further than union struggles ever can? Um, and, you know, that's what you've got to figure out. I don't, you know, I don't know what to do with that situation necessarily. Um, but, you know, you see these inklings of, of potential and it's about finding ways to generalize them and further them and building confidence because, you know, uh, I've, trade unions are always going to be limiting. Um, that's, you know, they're mediators between labor and capital. That's, that's their role. Um, you know, maybe that'll change, but it's unlikely. Um, but you're never going to get people taking action outside of unions um, unless you build their confidence, unless you uh, find ways to increase their struggles uh, and escalate their struggles. Um, and, you know, a way in which people will gain confidence and find the strength to do that is probably through doing trade union activity. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a messy one. Um, I'm not sure I really have an answer for you, um, but that's, yeah, a general idea. Yeah, I think that's a really good starting point to, to some of those discussions is, you know, it's the contradiction of of trade union work, right? That unions play, you know, a role for many workers in being the institutional form through which they can take action. But, you know, as Matthew says, this is also not like a revolutionary, it's not a revolutionary party. And, you know, we've joked at various points of, you know, some of us who've been through revolutionary parties of one kind or another, substituting revolutionary parties for, for, for unions. And there's a big limitation of this, right? But I think if you look at it the other way around, it's much better, I think, for revolutionaries to spend their time organizing with and hopefully beyond people in unions than it is people spending their time organizing inside of and rarely outside of revolutionary parties that are essentially cut off from from the workers movement because i think you know there are moments of inquiry that you can do with people in unions when you are part of collective struggles when you try to understand where leverage is you know what the challenges are what the potentials are in different moments that's also about finding out what new moments of political composition are possible um and i think it becomes a kind of seed bed or a test bed through which you can find out like where where struggles are at in one way or another. And I think Matthew's example of of, of the wildcat action of of support workers, I think, is a really important one. Of there are going to be lots of moments. You know, I think there's going to be a bit of a crushing moment for some people of finding out like exactly where the British trade union bureaucracy is at in the next couple of months where like a number of deals are taken that people are like, oh my God, but this trade union general secretary is a left-wing secretary. Like they would never sell out workers. It's like, oh, wait until you hear about the history of trade unionism, right? Like there's a long history of, of doing this. As an older comrade once said to me, what's the difference between a left-wing and a right-wing trade union bureaucrat? Well, the left-wing bureaucrat sells you out later than the right-wing one, right? Mm. Like it's a kind of matter of time. But I think if we say we don't want to get involved in this because it's not proper revolutionary politics, you then miss the connections with people upon which a revolutionary politics or a serious revolutionary politics can be forged, which is people who are engaged in struggles in and in, around and beyond the workplace. Yeah, I mean, really just echoing what um, Jamie has said, I think where a lot of workers who are embedded rooted in their workplaces and already in trade unions then it would be crazy if you were joining to that workplace to not join that union because you would just then be cutting yourself off from the rest of your from, from all the people your comrades in your workplace but um 
there's there's no but i think there's sometimes a little bit of a uh, presupposition that because you uh want to build a union or you want to um recruit people in your workplace to a union that somehow that means that you cede all authority to that organization and i think it's crucial that people understand that just because you are in a union that doesn't undermine or reduce the absolute necessity of you and the people you work with being organized and deciding what approach you're going to take together and if you look back at all the big trade union struggles of the 20th century, there was plenty of trade union branches in workplaces that would have gone against their leadership at critical moments and would have tried to pressure situations to, you know, uh, uh, I think we were talking about this the other day, funnily enough, and I was recollecting a picture of um, miners in 1982 who, before the, the great miners strike had officially started but in the warm-up to it who were having a mass lobby of a trades council meeting in the num so you know when you've when you've got workers turning up to lobby their own committees there's no way you can deny that they are showing a level of independence and having the confidence of their own authority that they're going to try and decide what actions need to be taken and take the steps to make that happen as well so you know being in favour of people building unions in their workplace doesn't mean that people should suddenly hand over all of the decision making to some external authority. That's, I think, what we're seeing more widely in society it happens all the time, right? You, you you open an app on your phone and all of the data that you say, yeah, I accept the cookies, whatever, and someone else has got all the decisions made for you. The same with, you know, any kind of um, sort of, main social interaction today that takes place via the computer you're seeding away all of that authority and people believe that it's the most convenient thing and so therefore it's right but actually we need to make sure we're not transplanting that attitude that we're encouraged to have from from work from uh you know leisure and everything else that's happening today we when you're trying to fight for your own future you can't take that attitude you have to make sure that you're the one in control of what's happening in your workplace. So that means that if you're in a union, don't let someone else make the decisions on your behalf. Make sure that you're making the decisions with your workmates. Totally. Uh, now there's, you know, going back to the book again, a huge difficulty when studying a moving object like class. <laughs> and a lot has happened since this book was released last November. Uh, and even more, since the project began back in 2021, uh, have any of the events of the past four months changed your views on class composition in Britain? Or have they confirmed any of the predictions that you made, like in this book or in any of your other writings? Or I mean, I, we were entirely correct and predicted everything. <laughs> um, so you should buy the book or read it for free. Uh, or get a free copy or, or however you want to get access to it. No, I mean, more seriously, I think when we were right, this is the, the great thing about trying to write about a moving target is, you know, there's always more exciting things or changes that, that are going to happen much more quickly. And I think we were really seeing the beginnings of the current movement that we're in now beginning to kick off as we were trying to finish the book. Um, and I think, you know, at any moment that you try and think about class composition, by the time you finish talking to people about it and writing about it, you know we would hope it has changed, right? It's not a not a static phenomenon that that that's unchanging. And I think there's a bit of a difficulty. Is like we're in a real period of flux right now, which I guess I was kind of saying about earlier. Of you know the next couple of months, you know who knows the direction that the kind of institutional working class struggle is going to move in. You know we're in a very significant confrontation right now of hundreds of thousands of workers out on individual days of unions that have rarely moved into open struggle or at least national struggle calling ballots trying to get people out we're seeing huge anger from the rank and file of unions in terms of rejecting deals or wanting to go on strike or thinking about what to do when they go on strike and these are moments where there's much more of a kind of hot inquiry you know, it's easier to do these sorts of things. It's easier to talk to people about going on strike when we're in the middle of a, a massive wave of strikes. Um, and so I think, you know, the story of class composition is always in the process of being written, right? 
Um, but I think I still think you know taking a moment to take stock is always an important thing to try and do because we can't say it's always changing. So let's just not think about class or struggle. You know, we'll just bluff our way as people who think we should orientate around it. It's like this is a constant process that we can only stop when we win, right? And then we can say, well, you know, we've kind of finished figuring out class composition, right? Yeah, I mean, like Jamie said, um, you know, class composition is is formed by class struggle and it's constantly changing. Um, and it would be silly to to think that, you know, the you know wave of struggles that have happened over the past you know six seven months since we finished writing this um, won't have changed some of the conclusions. Um, but I think a lot of stuff in there is still relevant. Um, you know, particularly around the more longer term trends, um, the more sort of lukewarm um, interventions you could call them that could be made um, around you know industrial level organisation uh, around supply chain um, organisation. Um, around where a rank and file can be built in certain sectors. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's all these new opportunities that, that have arisen that we need to work out now, um, probably even yesterday, um, that, you know, <laughs> we can't have predicted in the book and we were predicted. Um, so if you do read it, which you should, um, <laughs> be critical uh, and think about these questions. I'm going to anything to that. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we have time for just one more question before we finish up. Uh, so I'd like to talk about the conclusion of the book. Uh, it ends with you offering some next steps. Uh, and this section outlines some of the directions in which your research here might be taken in the future. Uh, you mentioned there that you want, you want to undertake some more detailed inquiries in the future. Uh, but you also state that uh, a map on its own is useless unless we use it to start trying to organize. Along those lines then, what kinds of opportunities or potentials for future organizing do you think your research in this project has opened up or exposed? Yeah, so look, I mean, I, I think we would be uh, misguided to say that as a, a relatively small group of revolutionaries who've written some stuff about a moment of class composition that this has has changed the balance of forces you know significantly i mean obviously you know it would be nice to be able to say that's the case i think though there are two things really i think the first is one of the the ideas behind notes from below one of the kind of driving forces from it is about trying to to put this argument more widely that what happens at work and what happens with worker struggles and what happens in communities around work matters for a revolutionary politics. And I think the book is an example of, you know, if you get people together and you start trying to do inquiries and you start talking to people about these things and encouraging workers to write about their conditions, there is a political usefulness in that. Um, that this is a project that is worthwhile and is worth doing. And always behind the stuff we do in notes from below is not the sense that, you know, we are like the guardians of inquiry and like it's only us who can can answer these things. It's how do we encourage more people to think about their work and their struggles collectively and use that not and of course the irony is you produce a publication at the end of it, but like not to produce publications, right? To get involved in struggles and to do them. Um and, you know, I think part of this is about how we equip people to engage in the struggles that are coming in the future. And I think right now we're in a moment where, you know, for the first time in my life, I think arguably, like the trade union bureaucracy is is entering into a series of confrontations and there is space for people to do things in their workplaces or inside of unions that will change depending on what happens with these struggles. Um, and we should think about what led us up to here, like what the way these struggles unfold right now, like what does that tell us about where we're at in terms of class composition in different sectors, in different unions, in different parts of the economy, and learn something from this, whether we win, we lose, or we yeah, 
continues to do what UCU does, which is like end up with these like bloodied draws over and over again of like, what can we all do differently in the next wave of struggles? Um, and the book is trying to make an argument for that, right? That we should all be thinking about these things and doing these things um, because that's what it means to be a revolutionary today, right? Yeah, I think um, just to add a little bit of what Jamie was saying, really, I think the crucial sort of next steps for people is not necessarily, you know, about getting stuff written up and published and out uh, on the web, which is obviously great if it does, because you can share that experience more widely. But actually, it's about developing a method for how you can approach the problems of organising at work. How is it that you can start to, in a in a bit of a structured way, start to really gather the knowledge you need to understand what's happening in your workplace and to be able to then, from that, you know, what's the next step? After you've, you know, organised your workplace and everyone's in your union branch, then how can you, can you start to understand what's happening more widely in the sector as well? How does it relate to other workers in other sectors? You know, there is like a real goal and ambition to this which is to be able to enable workers without relying on anyone else to be able to understand what what tasks they need to complete to be able to advance their own interests and that's this is just a small part of you know a small contribution in a long history in reality of people trying to enable others to do this so um, the more widely it gets taken up and the more that work it starts to enable people then uh, the more exciting our future might be, whatever happens with these disputes in the short term. Yeah, I guess I'll, you know, final thoughts on that. Um, the, the thing that seems most immediate uh, and practical to me in terms of, you know, the conclusions and the outcome of the project and, and the effects it has is starting to build these sort of networks of people um, who can take action, um, who can work together towards some sort of uh, escalation of struggle or intervention in struggle. Um, a bit, you know, it's you know, maybe a bit of a cringy orthodox Marxist metaphor, but, you know, a bit like how Lenin saw Iskra working as sort of a, a skeleton of some sort of greater form of organisation. Um, and I think, you know, particularly speaking towards the education sector stuff um, from the book, you know, part of that was having these day long meetings with, you know, a dozen other education workers from all over uh, and just talking through our experiences and, and our work um, and, and creating bonds through that. And now we're, we're seeing this moment where, you know, every university in the country is on strike, pretty much every school in the country is on strike. Um, and this like, mass wave of struggle is happening. You, you've sort of already built that base um, where you can maybe start thinking about doing something that previously uh, would have seen, seemed less possible. Um, so I think that's, you know, one exciting outcome. Um, and I guess, you know, it's less about what the project has already produced, uh, and more about what it's created the potential to produce in the future. Um, so hopefully, yeah, good stuff. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your, uh, uh, responses to my hopefully not too tedious questions. Um, just before we finish up then, I would like to give you all the opportunity to plug anything that's going on with you Note know, from Below or in your lives outside of it that you might like to share with some of our audience and get them involved in if possible. I know, Jamie, for example, you and another of the comrades in Notes from Below have a book coming out in a couple of months with Verso. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the reminder. It's always important to uh, to plug books, particularly on a podcast about about books, right? You know, this is this is the time to do it. Um, so Lydia Hughes uh, and myself have a book coming out with Verso called uh, Troublemaking, which is about the politics of of organising at work. Um, I guess yeah. The other thing to say is you know we're in the process of putting together another issue at Notes from Below. If people are interested in inquiry and class composition, you know, we try to make sure everything is available in an accessible way on the website um, to make sure that books can be sent out to people. Uh, if, if people want to read them, donations, of course, always, always welcome. And if you want to do an inquiry, 
or you want to start something like this, you know, send us an email. We're always happy to jump on a call to talk things through with people to support you. Um, because, you know, writing things up is not the end point, but it can be a useful way of thinking through dynamics. Um, and we're very happy to support people doing that. Matt, Chaz, is there anything that you guys would like to plug as well? The next issue of Notes from Below, which Jamie has already covered. I haven't got anything <laughs> else to plug. Matt, have you got anything else to plug? Uh, no. <laughs> All right, then. Well, well uh, yeah, thank right. the three of you. <laughs> thank the three of you so much for coming out of the podcast, joining us today, talking to us about class composition in Britain, the development of the working class, and especially about your book and your ongoing work. Uh, Hope you all have a great night and best of luck with things. Thank you very much. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.